U.S. and Taliban leaders signed a historic agreement in hopes of ending America's longest war in Afghanistan. Hi, everyone. I'm Sean Caleb sitting in for Anand Naidu, and this is The Heat. Within the next 10 days, Taliban leaders are expected to begin negotiations with the Afghan government over a ceasefire and political settlement. This after the militant group and the United States signed a deal over the weekend in Doha in an effort to end the 18-year war. Under the agreement, the Taliban will not allow al-Qaeda, ISIL, or any other extremist group to operate in Afghanistan while the U.S. gradually withdraws its forces. It also calls for a prisoner swap, but on Sunday, Afghan President Ashraf Ghani said he would not abide by the terms of a release negotiated by the U.S. as a prerequisite for talks. And on Monday, the Taliban announced it would resume offensive operations against Afghan security forces. The U.S. chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said some violence is to be expected. Um, I would caution everybody to, to uh, think that there's going to be an absolute cessation of violence in Afghanistan. That is probably not going to happen. It's probably not going to go to zero. Uh, so this, this is a significant step forward, uh, this agreement, and it's going to lead to inter-Afghan uh, dialogue, and it ultimately leads to a peace agreement. Uh, but to think that it's going to go to zero. Okay, now for more on the prospects for peace in Afghanistan, let's bring in our panel. Here in our Washington studio is Omar Samad. He served as the Afghan ambassador to France and Canada and is a non-resident senior fellow with the Atlantic Council. Ahmad Shah Mohibi is founder and president of Rise to Peace, a nonprofit organization. And from Columbus, Ohio, Peter Mansour. He served in the U.S. Army for 26 years and is the chair of military history at the Ohio State University. All of you want to thank you very much. Look forward to the chat. Ambassador, I want to begin with you. We heard the general just now from the Pentagon say it's not going to go to zero uh, quickly in violence, but any hopes that this would go very smoothly seem to be dashed. There was an explosion today at a football pitch, at least three people killed, 11 injured. What does this say about the arrangement that had been negotiated? Is it already in jeopardy? I don't think so. Uh, I think no one expects this to be smooth. No one expects this to be fast. No one expects this to be without any glitches. I think that we have entered a new phase. I think what happened, we have to take this in strides and put it in context. What we saw happen this past weekend with the signature, both by the Taliban and the U.S. envoy, is the end of the beginning, the beginning of an end of the war in Afghanistan, which means that it's the best that we could have accomplished over a 20-year period. And so I think credit goes to those who have worked very hard to come to this point. Now, it can become politicized, and some people can, can, can agree with it. Can, mm -hmm. Some people can have arguments against it. At the end of the day, from an Afghanistan perspective, it's the best thing so far. But everybody knows that the road ahead is full of potholes, full of hurdles and obstacles and spoilers. Mm. of all kinds, whether they are terrorists or whether they are political spoilers or regional spoilers. So it's not an easy process, but we have reached this point, and I think we need to do the best possible to take the next steps. Yeah, interesting use word spoiler. Ahmad, I'd like to turn to you because I don't want to lose fact, uh, sense of the fact that Afghanistan is a young country. The mm -hmm. medium age is, is about 18, and you seem to have what is best in Afghanistan, a young person out there uh, talking about the important issues. How significant is it? that the Afghan government has not been part of the negotiations up until now. And the president has made it clear that he is not going to be beholden to something the U.S. and Taliban agree. This is what Ashraf Ghani had to say. Listen to this first. There is no commitment to release the 5,000 Taliban prisoners. We have repeatedly and transparently shared this issue with Zalmay Khalizad and the other officials, as this is the legal and absolute right of the people of Afghanistan. There was a request, but it can only be part of the negotiations, and it cannot be a precondition. And, of course, uh, Zalmay Khalizad is the special envoy mm -hmm. uh, for the Trump administration. Your thoughts on, on what you just heard, and how concerned are you? Well, it was a U.S. Uh, Taliban deal, not Afghan Taliban deal. 
and this was the, the, it's the beginning of the Afghan peace process, and it's not the end of it. So, I mean, President Afghanistan has every right to criticize, agree or disagree with a deal, but I think a roadmap for the broader Afghan peace process that could have the broader Afghan community and Af political community to be able to sit and negotiate and table, this was a necessity. It was the American government uh, negotiators work hard for the past 18 months to bring the United States' longest war, which is nearly 20 years, to an end. But this is the base to God. I, I agree with the ambassador because there's going to be spoilers, there's going to be obstacles. Uh, but President Afghanistan, I think this was the biggest chance that they had. I think it was a strong leadership under President uh, Trump uh, on making sure this happens. You know, is it perfect? I do not agree with that. But what's the best choice in here? Afghanistan's war uh, turned 41 years and 10 months. For the United States, 18 years. So I think uh, US administration, civil societies, Afghan government, Afghan political community, leaders, including former uh, President Omar Karzai, they all agree to one thing, that war is not winning through military and guns and killing. Right. So any efforts to bring violence is in the best interest of Afghans, United States. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of his bumpy roots. So there's going to be a lot of problems. And that goes back to power. You know, Taliban wanted power. We, get, we, we took the power from them. So we, we have to give them back, and we are giving them back. The same way with political parties in Afghanistan. I mean, the current president, he wants power. So power is a strong thing, and so, but it has a cost. But the cost should be the national interest in Afghanistan. Uh, Peter, I think if you ask a lot of U.S. citizens, they think that a lot of their troops have paid a big cost for this. And now Trump wants to have the drawdown from something like 13,000 to 8,600 within uh, the next four months. If you think about the average age of these troops out in the forward operating bases, they may have been in nursery school when this war began. What do you think about the drawdown? And what about the comparison some are making to the way the U.S. got out of Vietnam a, a whole generation ago? Yeah, well, if you look at uh, this from the Taliban's perspective, they negotiated a withdrawal of all the foreign forces first before they had even one meeting with the Afghan government. So it's clear what the Taliban wants. They want the United States and other foreign forces out of Afghanistan so they can either uh, get a deal with uh, Kabul or they can continue the fighting and, and they think they have the upper hand and can defeat the Afghan government without foreign forces backing them. You know, the American people are, are tired of the, uh, the war in Afghanistan. I wouldn't say that they're um, tired of the sacrifices they're making because less than 1% of Americans serve in uniform. They're just tired of hearing about it. And so I think this agreement would be widely applauded in the United States. But, um, you know, the question is, will this be like the deal in Colombia that actually leads to an enduring political settlement, or will this be like uh, Lebanon, where it will just lead to further chaos, or will, will this be like Vietnam, where the agreement led to the withdrawal of US forces, and two years later, North Vietnam conquered the country? It remains to be seen which of those models mm. this, uh, this agreement follows, and I think the most critical stages are upcoming. Ambassador, I want to talk about Pakistan as well, mm -hmm. because this is kind of the unspoken uh, entity right now. And clearly, Pakistan had a lot to do with bringing the two sides to Doha. But at the same time, Pakistani officials have also been blamed for providing a safe haven for the Taliban uh, in that uh, disputed area, the, the, right, right on the border, not disputed, but just the area right on the border. How is this going to move forward? What does Pakistan get out of this? And how is it being looked at on the ground among Afghans? Yeah. So Afghans in general and all those involved in Afghanistan issues uh, for the past, uh, I would say, 40 years, but especially the past, past 25 years since this group called the Taliban emerged uh, before 9-11, um, their policy has been known. I think that there is no secrecy about what Pakistan intends to do mm -hmm. or intended to do and what strategy drove Pakistani policy to this day. And they feel that uh, they are justified. They feel that they may, through the Taliban now uh, being a part of the equation, that they uh, have, again, a piece of the pie. Uh, you see, I think what they, the Pakistanis saw was a loss of this piece of the pie after 9-11 when the Taliban were toppled. And since then, we haven't been able to find the right formula mm. to bring Pakistan back into the fold as a country, a neighbor with justified interests 
legitimate interests. What Afghans are most uh, obviously uh, concerned about are neighbors, including Pakistan, who have uh, unjustified interests or interests that are not very legitimate and that can hurt Afghans as well as stability, as well as our relations with them. So what we need to look for right now is some change in Pakistan that could help us move the relationship forward in a way that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So we're looking for some novelty. We're looking for some shift in the paradigm that Pakistan has been pursuing for all these years. And the hope is that with the Taliban coming and becoming part of the Afghan political society and political family, if, the, if this is what's going to happen over right, the next right, right. month and years, then that it will also calm the region to some extent. St stability in Afghanistan, peace in Afghanistan can also help the whole region. And Ahmed, while it's being heralded as something great, you know, something moving forward, perhaps the first step toward a long-lasting peace, there is a lot of skepticism on the ground in Afghanistan. And as Peter pointed out, the Taliban's number one objective was making sure all the U.S. troops had the big drawdown. What is the concern about that? Because clearly the Afghan military is not ready to provide sole protection for that country. Well, um, I'm a big supporter of U.S. presence in Afghanistan because uh, growing up not in the war, but I've worked there and I've seen it, and people understand that there are certain Afghans uncertain. This argument for sure has give a lot of hope, but there's a lot of skepticism because Afghanistan is re not ready. Kabul is not ready. Mm -hmm. The power vacuum left by the Soviet Union. 1991, the Russians left Afghanistan. And 1992, the civil war started. The Afghan Mujahideen poured into the city. So that was two years. Did it not last that long? And, the, and, and that also primarily happened with the financial support that the Soviet Union cut down. So I, I see that, you know, first of all, we are dealing with an insurgency. Secretary Pompeo still considered Taliban a terrorist organization with the hands of Americans on their hands. Sure. So uh, with that with being said, I think we should be cautious, not put the national, U.S. national interest, uh, you know, in jeopardy with, with, the, with a deal because we, ha we have to be cautious and about this. And the Afghans really, really believe because there's a lot of rumors that Afghans may not like the U.S. presence in Afghanistan. But I think given the, the Taliban trustworthiness is, is a big issue. So for that reason, I think, it, there has to be counterterrorism operations. There has to be training with the Afghan security forces. And because the Taliban, or right now, are, are just bragging about that they defeated the strongest military in the world, and they're going on and on, I think it's very selfish and premature movement while they haven't put anything in action. So uh, U.S. Uh, role in Afghanistan is really, really critical, given the tensions, latest tensions with Iran, with, with the movements that they have in the Pakistan. I simply cannot put full trust on a Taliban insurgency because they could say, you know, whatever they want, <clears throat> but look at what happened this morning. Absolutely. So uh, we, we should be very careful. And, and also, uh, Peter, talking about that presence and how things are, are going to move forward, uh, in an interview with CBS, U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo talked a bit about the deal with the Taliban and about the fact that the Taliban has agreed to not work with al-Qaeda, other insurgent uh, entities. Here's what Pompeo had to say, and I want to get your reaction in just a second. The gentleman I met with agreed that they would break that relationship and that they would work alongside of us to destroy, deny resources to, and have al-Qaeda depart from that place. And you trust that? Don't trust anything. We're going to deliver. It's about actions. The agreement set out the conditions, it set out the space. But no, this deal doesn't depend upon trusting anyone. It has a deep, complex, well thought out, multi-month negotiated verification complex and mechanism by which we can observe and hold every member of the agreement accountable. We'll do that. It's not about trust. It's about what happens on the ground. Yeah, Peter, and also the Taliban has always called the U.S. troops there as occupiers. Give me your thoughts on what the Secretary of State had to say, and what do you think is going to happen moving forward? Well, clearly that's the key U.S. interest, to make sure that Afghanistan is never again used as a base for international terrorist organizations. It's the reason we went into Afghanistan in 2001 in the first place. But I I'm with the S Secretary of State. I'm skeptical that the Taliban uh, can sever its links with al-Qaeda. And there are some groups like the Haqqani Network that uh, aren't, aren't controlled by the Taliban. So it's, it remains to be seen if the government in Kabul and the Taliban can come to some sort of power sharing agreement, whether they in unison will turn on these terrorist organizations and kick them out of the country. 
you know, deeds, not words in this case. It has to be verified, and, um, and I'm skeptical, but we'll see if it happens. May, may I, may I sure. say that uh, when it comes to, I think, Al-Qaeda, and if we leave ISIS and others uh, alone for a second, I think that the Taliban have made a commitment and they will have to stick to it. Now, what happens is not that the Taliban and Al-Qaeda cannot severe ties. It's that if there are some Taliban who still feel that they are the, the closeness to Al-Qaeda, whether it's the ideology, whether right. it's, then they will break away from the Taliban. So the, 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 what, would, what might happen is that the Taliban will lose some of their fighters to Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and others. It's an F. We do not know to what extent they have control over their organization. But I think that the mainstream Taliban will break away from Al-Qaeda. From Al you know, you bring up a, a good point, because people in the United States, when you say the Taliban, they think of one entity. There are many different factions of the <coughs> Taliban. And also, the Taliban may be loyal to each other, but they're more loyal to their clan in various areas of the country as it's well. A complex, it's a very complex it's a situation. Complex situation. So in thinking about now having members of the Taliban in parliament with people from Mazar, from Herat, wherever. Can the Afghan government work with members of the Taliban? So let's get to the Afghan government. When we say Afghan government, uh, we are, uh, most Afghans nowadays are thinking of not only Mr. Ghani, but they are thinking of the post 9-11 order. So it's the state, the larger state mm -hmm. as a whole that encompasses people like Karzai and all the other chieftains and who still powers. has a very large house and, on the and, presidential ground absolutely and so they they all matter in afghanistan <laughs> whether we like it or not mr ghani may not like it because he wants to, he wants to claim that he has dominion and control over everything but that is not what how the others are seeing it and this is why this week is very important mm. to see whether the palace where mr ghani is and other afghans will come to terms on how to forge a more unified, more <coughs> cohesive front that could then engage the Taliban in discussions about the future of Afghanistan. And this is where it's going to be a test, whether somebody is going to spoil this or somebody is going to be facilitating and helping the process move forward. And, and we talked about this uh, <coughs> at the beginning, but the next step now is going to be having the Taliban sit down with the Afghan government. And uh, I think if you talk to a lot of people internationally, they can look, Ahmed, at the problems mm -hmm. Afghanistan has had over the last 18 years, but the birth rate, mortality rate is, is, is better. People mm -hmm. are living longer. Water, uh, education for women, uh, things of that nature. If the Taliban does come back and has a significant role in power sharing, a lot of women are very concerned about moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I want to play you a quick clip from what one activist, who's also a veterinarian, had to say about women's roles in Afghanistan. I think the arrival of the Taliban will affect every woman's right to work, freedom, and independence. Not only for me as a veterinarian, but also all women who want to work in Afghanistan and be free and independent will be affected. I don't think the circumstances will remain the same. Perhaps some rules and restrictions may be put in place that will hinder a woman's progress. Ahmed, I, I want to follow up on that. When I was there last year, we profiled a young woman, an engineer educated in the U.S., who was helping rebuild Darlaman Palace. So that eyesore on the west uh, end of the city, which is now built by Afghans. It looks, looks wonderful. And she was so hopeful. She's not in the country anymore. So what are the concerns with the Taliban having perhaps a very significant role in the government? Could they go back to what happened in, in the 90s? I think there's going to be a lot of problem with that. The Taliban, I look at it with 60,000 uh, fighters. Uh, one of the biggest reasons I see is that they are so radicalized and they, are so, they have so much hateful propaganda inside their, their brains that that's going to be the biggest problem. You know, all these peace process right now happening, the talks, intra-Afghan talks, the leaders, that is going to have a lot of bumpy road in it. It's going to be, you know, a while. But when it comes to the Taliban, their ideology, I, I, I studied about them. I mm -hmm. studied about Taliban. I studied about Al-Qaeda and ISIS. There is one thing they, common, they share in common, and that is this Islamist radical extremism that they have in common. They put that to justify their actions, but what they are after is more into power. They are more into more what they can be able to get out of the best out of it. Because there's nothing in Islam that talks about what the Taliban are doing so inhuman actions and barbaric actions. 
the, the woman that, that lost her life, mm. uh, there were thousands of them like that lost their lives. The Taliban with the beheading, that so many torturing of women, stoning women. I think that could be a big problem. That could be a big challenge. You know, one thing that I spent time in Kabul, and one thing I can assure you in Afghanistan, no one is willing to give the gains of the past 18 years. Right. There are 40 TVs there. There's Afghan star, American talent style. There are singers. There is so much progress. There are Facebook, has selfies. You think Taliban may have a problem with that. But what is going to happen is I think the long, it's going to be a long route. I think one thing that Afghans need to understand, that, and most of them understand, is it's not easy. But the Taliban has to accept that. And that's one of the things I say U.S. needs to assure that these gains are not lost. Why we spend $2 trillion? We have to save that, and we have to, thousands of lives that are lost here. So the Taliban needs to understand that this is not 1990s anymore. This is 2020. Uh, Peter, I want to talk about the U.S. troops who will remain there, some 8,600. What will they be doing, and will it be enough to make sure areas in the east, Holst and Jalalabad, in the south, Helmand, Kandahar, that these areas will not blossom into violence and have another uh, full-on civil war? Well, there are three major things that uh, U.S. forces can do uh, for the Afghan army and the Afghan security forces. Uh, the first is we can train them. So the advise and equip and training mission will continue trying to get the Afghan army up to, uh, up to speed, up to strength, and make sure it can take over. Uh, the second is uh, selected special forces units continue, continue to conduct uh, limited raids against high value targets in conjunction with the Afghan security forces. And the third thing is air power. And if you look at the history of uh, South Vietnam or even Afghanistan Af uh, between 1988 and 1991, neither of those states would have fallen had their patron continued to fund them and continued to provide significant amounts of uh, advisors and air support. So provided the United States remain enga remains engaged in Afghanistan going forward, I don't see any way the Taliban can secure a military victory, which is why you know, hopefully they'll come to some sort of diplomatic agreement, political agreement at the negotiating table. As an Army officer, Peter, though, your thoughts, do you think that the U.S. will indeed pull out at some point and leave Afghan up to its own resources? You know, I think it's unlikely that this will be like 1973, or rather 1974, when Congress actually cut off aid to South Vietnam. Uh, I, I see American aid continuing. And depending on what the two sides at the negotiating table will agree to, I could see some sort of American military involvement, primarily in a train and equip capacity going forward. But um, this, again, will have to be one of those things that's hammered out between the Afghan government and the Taliban, because clearly the Taliban wants us gone and the Afghan government wants us to stay. So what the exact uh, parameters of the U.S. involvement going forward will be remain to be seen. Yeah, indeed, uh, moving forward, as the ambassador talked about, something very important is going to be how quickly uh, Afghan government begins to negotiate with the Taliban. And Pakistan's foreign minister, Shah Mahmoud Qureshi, is calling for this negotiation to begin as swiftly as possible to improve relations. Here's what he had to say. You know, the trust deficit uh, has existed. Pakistan has done its best to bridge the trust deficit. Uh, my very first visit as foreign minister was to Kabul, just to reassure them how important Afghanistan is for Pakistan, how important Kabul is to Pakistan. Because if we want peace and stability in Pakistan, we feel that there's a direct linkage between uh, you know, peace in Afghanistan and peace in Pakistan. And Ambassador, one thing that we really need to point out is Dr. Abdullah Abdullah has been in Doha for at least some of these discussions. How important is that? No. He has not been? No, he has not. I, no, I, I read a story just before I came out. No, uh, he has not been. Uh, not, nobody from uh, Kabul, basically, has been in Doha recently. There were some uh, Afghans who went there in the past as part of informal talks. But uh, to the point made here, uh, I think that Trust building is very important moving forward. We have issues right now that have to do with uh, reduction in violence. How do we continue that? Mm -hmm. That's part of it. Uh, we have uh, issues that have to do with prisoner exchange that is not now turning into a glitch, a major obstacle moving forward, uh, where Prison Ghani, Prison Ghani uh, is, is, is basically 
saying no, and he says that it has to be part of negotiations, and the Taliban are asking as a prerequisite that it be done before talks start. So we have a lot of work in the next few mm -hmm. days and weeks coming up, and trust building is going to be important. There are those who want to kill trust and those who want to build trust, and we have to make sure that we do the right thing. Ahmed, you obviously have some concerns. Is now the right time to build this trust? Is now a good time to move forward? I think this is a golden opportunity. <clears throat> it's for the Afghans themselves and domestic factor. Afghanistan political leaders, including the Afghan government and the broader leaders, needs to, first of all, have a political compromise, political share. Mm -hmm. And right now, Dr. Abdullah, he finalized a list of negotiators. They're waiting for that, the government. That's, that's also not final. Oh, that's, oh, that's, I mean, I think it, the first thing is needs to be the Afghan government. Yeah. And then they need to work with the Pakistan. And after that, they need to work with the Taliban. But I think there's going to be a lot of problems with the prisoners' release. Mm -hmm. And there's going to be a lot of problem uh, with some of the, the skepticism that, you know, U.S. has made secret deals with the Taliban that a lot of people doesn't know, including us and the public. So moving forward, this is the best opportunity for the Taliban to prove their loyalty to peace, not violence. Uh, Peter, we've heard a uh, very passionate discussion here uh, from uh, folks that have so much at stake in Afghanistan. What do you say to the people in the United States that say that Donald Trump is pushing this through right now because he's going to use it as a pawn during, for his re-election effort? Well, that may be or it may not be, but the final withdrawal of U.S. forces will occur after the end of the presidential election this year. So it will be really up to the next president whether to follow through with this agreement or whether to back off. So yeah, I mean, I'm sure the president uh, will take whatever political gains he can get from uh, the, the deal, but this has been something that's been negotiated now for a long time. Uh, both the Obama and the Trump administration have uh, reached out to the Taliban. So we need to really, and, and I trust Zalmay Khalilzad. Mm -hmm. I worked with him in Iraq. And I think he's, uh, he's a straight shooter. So I think we need to take the agreement on face value that, it's, uh, that our negotiators uh, did what was in the best interest of the United States and uh, move forward from this point. I'd like to thank you all uh, for joining us today on this panel. We'd like to continue a lot more to say. I'm sure this isn't going away. So hopefully we'll have you all back soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And that does it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Sean Calebs in Washington, D.C. Thanks, everybody, for watching. Hello everybody, I'm Anand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists and others. It's a fresh, focused and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict or US politics, The Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find The Heat Podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search The Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.